welcome to the Dental Team Podcast. I'm your host, Kara Dent, and I have this crazy idea that maybe I could combine a doctor and a team member's perspective, because let's face it, dentistry can be a challenging profession with those two perspectives. I've been a dental assistant, treatment coordinator, scheduler, filler, office manager, regional manager, practice owner, and I have a team of traveling consultants where we have traveled to over 165 different offices coaching teams. Yep, we don't just understand you, we are you. Our mission is to positively impact the world of dental, and I believe that this podcast is the greatest way I can help elevate teams, grow VIP experiences, reduce stress, and create A teams. Welcome to the Dental A Team Podcast. Hello, Dental A Team listeners. This is Kira, and oh my gosh, am I fangirling with our guest today, Bob Berg, the co author of The Go Giver. You guys, this man has changed my entire life, and he literally, I'm geeking out, is on our podcast today. Bob, like truly fangirling Kira over here. How are you today? Welcome to the Dental A Team show. Oh, I'm great. You have a way of making an old man feel very special. So thank you so much. <laughs> so Bob, it was just over a week ago, my husband and I were sitting at dinner and we saw you comment on the Go Giver podcast that we put out. And I literally texted my whole family. I said, you guys, this is top career highlights. I said, Bob Berg is commenting on this. Then you and I Instagram messaged and I was just totally inspired by you. I'll share a little bit of my story, but you guys, honest to goodness, Bob, you've changed my life and Dental A-Team is here because of your guys' book. And so before wow. I get into my whole story, I feel like the listener should know a little bit about you and you're the co-author of The Go-Giver. I'm going to share guys why The Go-Giver is such like, like today I couldn't even sleep. Like this is better than Christmas for me because it's truly <laughs> just been a life-changing book for me and my whole life. But Bob, tell us a little bit about yourself. You are this incredible author. You've written so many things. You're a keynote speaker across the globe. So tell us just a little bit about who is Bob Berg? How did you even get to where you are today? Yeah, I actually began as a broadcaster, uh, first in radio doing sports and then um, television news. Uh, I wasn't particularly good at it, not at the news thing, uh, better at sports than, than news. And it, yeah. it really wasn't long before I was uh, not doing news anymore and mm -hmm. I needed a job. So I, I kind of, I like to say I graduated into sales. Uh, uh -huh. I knew nothing about sales when I started. So I, I floundered for the first few months. Um, then I was in a, uh, a bookstore just looking for some books on something. I remember this is 40 years ago. So I, uh -huh. it's not like people knew about sales books and all the personal development things, unless you knew you didn't know. So right. I wasn't sure what I was looking for, but I happened to stumble upon two books on selling. One was by Zig Ziglar and the other by yes. Tom Hopkins, two of the real, um, <laughs> icons, right. Yes, in the, they in the are. sales space. And uh, I got their book. First of all, it was just encouraging to me to know there were sa books about sales because I had no idea, <laughs> right? That what yeah. there's a methodology to this. You, and um, so I I got the books. I always like to say I I didn't read them. I devoured them. Yeah. And I would just study every night into the wee hours of the morning, and I would practice, and I would drill, and I'd rehearse, and I would you know. Within a few weeks, my sales began to actually go pretty well. I mean, really well. And mm -hmm. um, I was hooked. And uh, I just started getting my hands on whatever books. And uh, and again, to, not to show my age, but cassette tapes, you would not even remember those. Oh, You're I do. I made before. mixed cassette tapes, Bob. Oh, like I might okay. look young, but I definitely had my mixed cassette <laughs> tapes. You better believe I'm right there with you. <laughs> okay. Well, and uh, <laughs> so that's, you know, so I get all the books and the tapes and the this, and I go to the seminars and the whole thing. But you know what the best thing was, was understood was recognizing or or I, I guess learning that it wasn't just the how-to aspect as important as that is it's the um personal development aspect so i was told to start getting all these these books of you know, how to win friends and influence people and think and grow rich and the magic of thinking big and psycho cybernetics and you know, all these great books that because i was a lousy student in, in school and and even in college i think i got into college on academic probation and i'm pretty sure I graduated on academic <laughs> probation. And then I, I just had no use for it. my education really began after I got in sales. Mm -hmm. And um, so, so it was really, you know, and, and so I did that. And uh, eventually I became sales manager of another company years later and began uh, then being asked by others to sort of teach you know, what is it that worked for? And, and it, it eventually morphed into a career uh, on, on speaking. And that's what I've been doing really for the last almost 35 years now. That's incredible. And so fun. I got to know what sports were you in? 
because I'm a diehard sports fan. My family, I'm the second of seven kids and all my brothers are like over six foot. So you better believe it. My dad's a basketball coach and <laughs> all the things. So what was your favorite sport of choice? I mean, you were in it. So yeah, I mean, when I was a kid, I just played the regular, you know, uh, baseball, basketball, football. Uh, as I got into high school, I, you know, my, my lack of ability in those areas kind of weeded me out of the, you know, the, the bigger ones. I was an amateur boxer for a few years. Wow. That was mostly out of, out of school from the time I was, I, I think, 17 to about 20. Um, and after that, just, you know, basically, uh, you know, pickup games, but, uh, so, you know, I was always playing softball, always playing, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, and just always loved it. Uh, and I loved the broadcasting aspect of it. And, uh, you know, I I grew up in the Boston area, so everything was Red Sox, Bruins, Patriots, and, (laughs) and Celtics and so forth. So yeah, that was, that was fun. That's so fun. Well, I'm so grateful you shared your story and I'll share a little bit about mine of how I even got introduced to you guys. So I, uh, my brother, I make the joke that my name's Kira Dent. I work in dental and it took me three fiancés to get this last name, which is all true. And so (laughs) I had actually just broken off my second engagement and I was beyond depressed and my brother worked for this geology firm. And, uh, he's a geophysicist now. And he said, Kira, you just need to come and work for us. And I'm like, Evan, I literally have no idea what I'm doing with geology. There's absolutely no way that I could ever do this. And so I went there and now they have these log printers. And I told them, I was like, oh my gosh, this job is awful. Like I would have to cut these pieces of paper perfectly and then tape them together for eight hours a day. And I just felt like, I mean, here I am second failed engagement is how I felt that I called it disengaged is what I called myself. Like I was no longer engaged. I was disengaged now. And I, my brother told me that his boss had recommended a book called The Go-Giver. And he said, Kira, I really think you should just read it. So I actually went and found my original copy that my brother gave me. It's all marked up. And I remember reading this. And at the time, I just, I was a dental assistant. I had just graduated college. I had just gotten out of an engagement. And I just felt like this book was so inspiring to me of like your true worth is determined by how much you give and value rather than what you take in payment and like being authentic you. And here I am thinking that no one wants me and uh, all these different pieces. But I read it and I thought for some reason in my heart of hearts, I think we always know when we want to run a business. And I always have said, if I run a business, I'm going to have it built upon the go-giver principles. And so fast forward to Dental A Team, and once I started Dental A Team, 100%, every one of my team members has always listened to this. Part of the core values, are our core values now are based on the go-giver. I wow. have our team read it every single year. I During COVID, when um, things were just hard, I thought, how can I help all of our dental clients? And I literally shipped the go-giver book out to every one of our clients and said, hey, this is a book that I think can inspire you, that can change your life. And so when you wrote on my LinkedIn post, I was like, oh my gosh, this is guy that I have like loved and listened to and read your work for so like I reread the go giver at least once a year just to remind myself of how to just always be giving more value than we take and to be loving more and to serve more and so Bob I just one want to say thank you for writing incredible work and for changing my life personally and now the lives of so many. So then when I was like hey let's do a follow up to the podcast where I just talk about how much I love this book I really just want to hear the flip side of it. Like, of course, everyone always says, you know, like, why did you write The Go-Giver? So I do want to know that. But I also want a secondary question of why you wrote The Go-Giver book. Did it actually result in what you wanted or was it a different result than what you guys even thought it would be after you wrote the book? So one, why did you write The Go-Giver? But then I definitely want to know the follow up. Sure. And and first, I, I want to make sure to credit my co-author, John David Mann, because he was really the the lead writer, the storyteller. You know, I'm a, I'm a how-to guy. I'm step one, step two, step three. You so I'm, <laughs> I'm actually relatively boring. I'm sure you're not boring though I am, but 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 he's a just a brilliant writer and, and this never could have happened without, you know, without John. Yeah. Um, so in terms of writing it years and years ago, back in the, I think, mid 90s, maybe even a little earlier, uh, no, I guess mid 90s, I had a, a book out called Endless Referrals. And the subtitle was Network Your Everyday Contacts into Sales. It was basically a book about business networking. Mm-hmm. Uh, back then, it was one of like three books on the market on business networking. Now there are hundreds of them on business mm-hmm. networking. And I've read many of them. And they're all wonderful. I learned from, from each and every one of them. Uh, but back then, it was just one of few. So that was kind of good as far as you know that goes. And um, But it was it was really a how-to for people who were entrepreneurs and salespeople who um, knew they had a great product or service, 
but they didn't necessarily feel comfortable uh, building the kinds of relationships in their area, right? right. Uh, where where people would feel good about them, where people would want to would would know them, like them, trust them, where people would want to do business with them directly and refer them to others. So it was basically a how to manual on such. It was the the basic premise was that all thing, and you'll recognize this from law number three in the Go Giver and in the Law of Influence. But the basic premise was that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those people they know like and trust. Uh, what was interesting is not only was it salespeople and entrepreneur, but a lot of people who were in, in well, I, I, I remember in the mid nineties or late nineties, I was asked to speak at the um, Hinman dental meeting and the Yankee dental yeah. Con, uh, yeah. conference. Those are big oh, ones. Uh -huh. excuse me. And why? Because dentists who are you know experts at what they do, they're wonderful practitioners, but typically do not like to think of themselves as being in sales. Amen. You know, so how do they go out there and without feeling, you know, as though they're being salesy, you know, how do they go out there when they meet people and, 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 and really kind of create those relationships? And the thing about the endless referral system is you take your focus totally off yourself mm -hmm. and you place it on the other person. Right. And so people get to know you, they get to like you, they get to trust you yeah. in a way that you feel very, you know, so someone who doesn't consider themselves salesy can feel very comfortable with it. So, you know, that was, a, and there was a how to book, but I'd always thought, I always loved reading parables since I'd been Same. in sales. I loved reading business parables. Parables are stories, stories connect on a kind of a heart to heart level. And right, it wouldn't be great if we could take that basic idea, turn it into a a business parable, but again, I'm, I'm, I can tell a story from stage when something has actually happened, but that's different from writing a book of a, a work of fiction, which is sure. what a parable basically is. So fortunately in the early 2000s, I was fortunate enough to meet John David Mann because he was the editor in chief of a magazine I was uh, writing for. And so every month, you know, we go back and forth on email. He would, he would, uh, you know, correct and edit my articles and he'd send them back with corrections, but he was always so kind and so humble and so, you know, and, and it was, uh, it was always, you know, I did this here, I fixed this here, I took this out here, is that okay? And, and I would, uh, you know, which isn't usually what happens with editors, right? right. And, and I, the running joke became, I would always write them back and say, John, not only is it okay, you write my stuff better than I write my <laughs> stuff. And so uh, eventually I, I asked him, you know, I, I brought this idea to him about the, uh, uh, you know, about the go-giver, this idea I had, I mean, it was just a basic idea. I did not have any kind of story written about it. And he and his, uh, at the time, fiance, now his wife, Anna, uh, they were visiting her mom who lived in Tampa on the other side of the state. They drove over four hours. One afternoon, we had a three hour dinner and we discussed the idea of the book and what it would be. And uh, as they said on uh, Seinfeld, yada, yada, yada. Right. <laughs> and eventually. And here we are. And uh, and, and you know, he, he agreed uh, to, you know, be the lead writer, storyteller for the book. Now, we you know, it didn't take us a long time to write the book once we started. The tough part was finding a, a publisher who wanted to publish it. Mm -hmm. Our agent got turned, you know, we got turned down by 24 publishing houses before wow. the 25th one picked us up and a portfolio, a division of Penguin Random House. And they turned out to be such a great, great uh, publishing partner. So it was the right, right people at the right time. Mm -hmm. That's incredible. And I am so glad you did bring up John David Mann, because of course, we don't want to leave him out as well. There was so much to it. But I'm curious, Bob, from what you guys had talked about at that three hour dinner is now <laughs> like there's such a community of the go giver. There's you guys yeah. have your daily emails, you've got the community of people you guys have mm -hmm. taught this into so many different organizations. Is what you thought of what it created? Is it more than what you thought? Is it, did it just evolve over time? Like, because I'm so curious because I think so many like dentists, right? They have a vision of what they want their practice to be. And then it evolves into something. Uh, there's so many self-help books out there. But to me, the go-giver is, I agree, it's sales. But, and truth be told, dentistry really struggles with sales. And I tell them all the time, like, bottom line is you're selling an amazing service. You get to give people the confidence mm, of their smiles. That's, that's right. Like you have a moral and ethical obligation that no, no, are you helping their smiles and their health? But like you're giving them the confidence in the world and like the the part of our body that literally feeds us, speaks for us, and like expresses ourselves, you get to give people that gift. And so like you've got to learn to be able to serve through sales all these different yeah. patients. So I'm just curious, did what you guys hoped would be, how is that now looking 
like now you get to look back and you get to reflect on all, your legacy of the go giver. How did that turn out from what you were expecting it to be at the time? Yeah, you know, I I thought and I, I we both believed that the marketplace was ready for it. That we thought it would be well received. Um, I don't think you can ever know when something's going to hit that big. And now it's sold, you know, just the, the first book itself in the series has sold like a million, 250,000 mm -hmm. copies and so forth. I, I don't know if you ever really know that it's going to do that because there's a lot that goes into that, that happening. You have to have a really great base of people who are your, what we call in the book, personal walking ambassadors. And you mm -hmm. never know if that's going to happen, but it did. So, uh, so yeah, I, we expected it would be successful, but I'm not sure we could, we knew that this was going to sure. really happen. Um, sure. But uh, yeah, so, you know, but, but getting back to a, a great point you made when you're talking to the dentist about, about sales, because when you think about it, what is selling, right? Mm -hmm. And by definition, selling is simply discovering what the other person needs, wants, or desires and helping them to get it. Brilliant. That's selling. The old English root of the word uh, sell was salan, which, which literally meant to give, okay? Mm -hmm. So when you're selling, you're literally giving. Now, someone might say, well, wait a second, Berg, that's clever and all, but isn't that just semantics, right? And I don't think so, because when you yeah. think about it, what are you really giving when you're selling? If you're in a sales conversation with a patient or a prospective patient, what are you giving when you're selling? You're giving them time, mm -hmm. attention, counsel, education, empathy, and ultimately immense value. Mm -hmm. So understand that, yes, as a, as a dental professional, you and those on your team, right, are selling. Yes. And when you look at selling from that foundational premise, you see it's really, as you said, and I thought you made a wonderful point about it, it's a very positive uh, aspect of your business. It's not a necessary evil. It's a wonderful part of it. And I'm so glad you brought that up because, I mean, I can speak authentically. I, I didn't share this part of the story, but also I had just had my that fiance I left. He had um, kind of smashed my face into a wall and oh, I gosh. now had um, a lot of dental visits. And oh, so not only am I reading so The Go-Giver, but I'm also back into dentistry and realizing that like they're giving me my confidence back. They're giving me my life Absolutely. back. They're giving me the ability to smile again and to feel confident with that. And those are things that I don't think dentists. Would. So I'm like, when you think of sales, yeah, you better learn to do this because uh, people like Kira, people like you, every single person needs dentistry and we need to have that. And so that's why I was so excited because I think like as a leader, it's such a brilliant book on it. Cause I think as leaders, we need to sell our vision to our teams. We need to be able to inspire them and how are they going to treat our clients and our patients and uh, whomever's coming in our way. And how are we always going to be referring to other people and giving more value than any person ever expects from us? Mm -hmm. I say that constantly and it literally has come from the go-giver, but I'm curious mm -hmm. if you could go back, is there anything you would have changed in the go-giver or are there anything you would like, I mean, you guys have written a whole series, so I would imagine there's a few things, but learning what you know now, would you add any changes to those five laws or would you expand upon any of them more? Would you reorder them? I'm just curious. Or you're like, nope, well, we think that it still is exactly how we wish, to, like how we'd want it today. The bit, well, basically it is, but there are a couple of things um, that I think we change. One is, you know, we, we like people to know that the opposite of a go-giver is not a go-getter. We love go-getters because go-getters take action, Yeah. right? And that's so important. And as, as business people, as practitioners, you know, we all know that you can have the, the nicest ideas, the, the greatest uh, of thoughts and the best of intent, but without action put into the mix, nothing's going to happen. It mm -hmm. simply cannot happen. So, uh, you know, we, we like, we say to people, you know, be a go-getter, person of action and a go-giver, someone mm -hmm. who is absolutely laser focused on providing immense value to others, be a go-getter and a go-giver, just don't be a go taker. That's mm -hmm. the person that would be the opposite of a go-giver. That's the person who feels entitled almost to take, take, take without having added value to the person, to the process, to the situation. In the story, when, when Gus says to Joe, I'll say this for you, Joe, you're a real go-getter. And Joe says, thanks. And Gus says, well, don't thank me yet. I think people got the idea that being a go-getter wasn't a good thing. And that's sure. not what we were, we were saying. What we were saying is Joe was a go-getter, which was great, but he was also a go-taker. 
at that mm-hmm. point. What mm-hmm. we wanted was for Joe through uh, the mentorship he received was to be a go-getter and a go-giver. So I, I think we would have made that point. And when we redid the book, this, the, the, the next edition of it, in which we put question and answers in the back mm-hmm. and discussion guide, we did answer that. But that's sort of like, you know, a headline in the newspaper on the front page, and then you correct it on the, you know, the sure. last column on the 28th page, you know. So, it was, uh, so you know, the, the, there was that. And so there were, uh, you know, a, a couple of things in there that we may have explained a little bit more. The tough thing is in a paragraph, you can't really get into the nitty gritty of explanations. Sure. It, it is by by definition almost a, a, a more of a 30,000 foot view. <laughs> Which I love. And I love that because I feel like it helps get you out of the like head and into the heart right, of exactly. listening to a story. And I also like that it's fuzzy because as I reread this book many times at different phases of my life, different phases of business, you pick up different pieces and you right. see the characters in different ways, which is why I love the beauty of it. I'm curious from your angle and from looking at this, which one of the the five is your favorite and why? Because of course, like we like they all stack, but I'm curious, like if you could only yeah. have one of them, which one would you take for you personally? So yeah, and I and I think it is an individual thing that we mm-hmm. all relate more maybe to one of the laws. They're all just as important because without any one of them, you, you can never get to that complete, you know area of stratospheric success as we we talk about but uh mine i think the one i relate to is more the law of influence Mm -hmm. and uh you know and i believe that's such an important important element such an important aspect of success i believe the uh, ability to influence which really when you think about it is about people skills uh is that's really the difference maker between that person who's reasonably successful and that one who's absolutely stratospherically successful they're able to work with people in such a way that they attain the results they want while helping other people feel genuinely good about mm-hmm. themselves mm-hmm. so i'm going to ask this is where i'm geeking out because i've been dying to ask you all these questions um like i've thought about them i've been so excited my husband and i was like Oh my gosh, I I feel almost like stage fright of I want to ask him all these things. And um, because what I was curious on here, we did a internal book club in our team, and then I create the podcast for the external podcast family. Uh, but I asked the questions of, do you guys really believe this? And I mean, I have been on this journey for the last 15 years. I've been a huge proponent of it. And I asked the question because I got jaded the other day and we did this like service and we were helping this woman out. And I was so annoyed because it felt like she, like I was so excited and my husband and I would like sacrifice a ton of time and money and she had no idea. And then she didn't even need it. And there was no, it felt like no appreciation. And so I've been so excited to ask you these questions of like my deep inner soul is like, sure. How do people go from, because I think like the world can feel jaded. I call the COVID, like during COVID, I called it the COVID crank. And I feel like as a society, people kind of got a little crankier potentially. But then I'm like, is it just about like what we focus on? I believe that like what we focus on, we receive in this world. So I've just been thinking like people might hear the go-giver ideas. They might be jaded by certain people. But like, how do you have this as your baseline? What are Mm -hmm. some of those tactical tools? Like, yes, there's a story, but what have you done too? Again, like you always put other people's interests first. You always are serving and you're giving more value. But I think sometimes the human being often takes over and you're like, you go back into this fight or flight and I've got to take care of myself and it's a survivalist mode. How do you overcome, I would say, the natural human being to keep this baseline? Because we know that it works. But I feel like it's oftentimes a a tappy war sometimes with your internal self as you're building these muscles. Yeah, well, it is counterintuitive, you know, when you think about it. So, So like, for instance, law number three is the law of influence, which says your influence is determined by how abundantly you place other people's interests first. But it's very important to understand something that when we say place other people's interests first, that doesn't mean you should be anybody's doormat uh, or a martyr or self-sacrificial in any way. Okay, absolutely not. It simply is Joe, the protege, learned from several of the mentors, and you and I were discussing this earlier, that uh, you know the golden rule of business, the golden rule of sales, golden rule of business development is that all things being equal, people will do business with and refer business to those who can say dental professionals they know, like, and trust. Well, here's the thing. There's no faster, more powerful, or more effective way to elicit those feelings toward you from others than by genuinely and authentically moving from that I focus or me focus to that other 
focus, looking to, as Sam, one of the mentors in the story, advised Joe, make your win all about the other person's win. Now, why does why is that so? Well, you know, Dale Carnegie in his his classic 1936 uh, How to Win Friends, Influence People, uh, which was such a wonderful book. Um, but I think he summarized everything in one sentence. Uh, I believe it was the foundational premise for everything he wrote, and that's where he said, ultimately, people do things for their reasons not Mm -hmm. our reasons. Yeah. Okay. That is human nature and it's a truth. Okay. And, uh, as I think it was Byron Katie who said, when you argue with the truth, you'll lose, but only 100% of the time. (laughs) So we need to understand that that is how people operate. Okay. And, uh, you know, when I used to speak at sales conferences, you know, now I do them virtually, but I used to be on the road for years and years and years yeah. and in doing those. And I could be standing in front of a whole room of salespeople. And the first thing I'd say is nobody's going to buy from you because you have a quota to meet. That's right? True. They're not going to buy from you because you need the money or would like to make the sale. They're not even going to buy from you just because you're a really nice person. They're going to buy from you because they believe they will be better off by doing so than by not doing so. Okay. And it's the same as a dental professional mm-hmm. uh, in the patients that you're, that you're dealing with. Okay. So it behooves you. It's actually, there, there's no faith that comes into play where you have to say, oh, but if I just do this, will it really work? Yeah. It takes more faith to believe that people will do business with you if you're nasty and self-centered. <laughs> True. Right. Because yeah. why would they want to do business with you? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it takes a lot less faith to think, well, people will do business with me if I'm a really good person. I mm-hmm. take care of them. They know that I have their best interest and well being at heart and I place their interest first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, you know, so, uh, but, you know, we're dealing with human beings and not everybody is going to be appreciative of what we do. Not everybody is going to express themselves in a way that we would like them to. One thing that we need to to understand is that when we're providing what we believe is of value to another person, value is always in the the eyes of the beholder, okay? Value by definition, um, you know, where price is a dollar figure, a dollar amount, uh, value is the relative worth or desirability of a thing, of something to the end user or beholder. In other words, what is it about this thing, this product, service, concept, idea, procedure, what have you, that brings so much worth or value to another person that they will willingly exchange their money, let's say for it in this case, and be glad they did while you make a very healthy profit, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the key is that it's not what we believe is of value to them or what we believe they should believe is of value to them. It's what they believe. So that's why it's incumbent upon us to ask the right questions, do the discovery, and and find out what is it that person's going to value and appreciate. Brilliant. Like I'm just sitting here and I, I can't wait for my team to listen to this podcast back. I can't wait well, for the dentist to hear this because there's so many truths pieces that you're putting out there. And I love, because I feel like it does become a way of life. And I love the story of Joe because Joe is not this person and he's expected to do every one of the laws that day and put it into Mm -hmm. place. And uh, really just seeing him transform on things that are, like you said, counterintuitive. And I feel like so many things in business are counterintuitive. And I think that that's why I love the game of business. I call it the game of business because I feel like business we think we go into business to better ourselves. And I feel like business is the refiner's fire that changes and morphs us into ultimately who we want to become. And so mm. learning that and seeing that in the go-giver, seeing that through sales, seeing that through dental offices, change and evolve. It's always crazy to me when I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you offer such an incredible service. People will happily happily write you a check. I remember I had one client and he wrote me this thing and he said, Kira, I just referred you to someone else. Like, And I told him, if Kira is the right fit for you, you write a check to her every single month with a smile because she has completely changed your life. And I thought I those that. are the things that make you just want to keep <laughs> doing this. And so it's such a crazy thing. And I love the, you know, how to influence people and just what I've learned through all this is we all go into this thinking. I, I know I went into this to, uh, 
like I wanted to have a business. I wanted to influence and serve more people. Yes, there's a monetary piece to it, of course. Like I've always mm-hmm. been intrigued by it. It's fun for me to figure out the numbers in business. Absolutely. But it's crazy to watch who I've become through business, ah, who I've become ah, ah. through serving more people and loving more people. And like you said, people can feel that authenticity. You can't mm-hmm. say it and not truly believe it internally. Right. But the internal is through the external output of how you really do. So it's just been a beautiful thing. I would ask my last question as we wrap up. I'm so just beyond grateful for you. So I hope you just know like how much you've blessed and influenced my life and just truly grateful. <laughs> and I would ask if you could, like you mentioned with Dale Carnegie, if you could summarize the go-giver into one pinnacle statement, what would you say? Like if we just took only one line from, I know that might be a, a feat, hopefully. I'll give you a second to kind of think because I'll keep chatting. But if you could have that wrapped into one, and it's not going to be perfect, it will change. It's who you are today, the experiences you've had. What would you say would be the one sentence or the, I'll give you a paragraph, whatever you choose to do, um, to take away from the go-giver and how you've like how it's changed your life or what you'd want people well, to take from that one. I, I, one I would say this. I'd say it's understanding that being a go-giver is, is recognizing that shifting your focus, and this is the key, shifting your focus from getting to giving. Now, when we say giving in this context, we simply mean constantly and consistently providing immense value to others. Understanding that doing so is not only a more fulfilling way of conducting business, it's also the most financially profitable way as well. Oh, amazing. Bob, it was such a true honor. I am so appreciative the of you. honor is mine, my friend. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you were able to come on. It was a whim. I just put it out there and asked, like, would you be willing to do a podcast? And I'm just so grateful you said yes. I'm thankful for The Go-Giver. And I would say for everyone listening, one, like, go snag The Go-Giver book for sure. But Bob, I know you have other ways that people can connect. I know there's daily pieces. How can other people get more of The Go-Giver in their life or just, like, dip their toes into how? How can they connect and get more of you? Yeah, I, I I think if they go to Berg, B-U-R-G dot com, they'll find everything there. There'll be one of those annoying little pop-ups that gives them the uh, uh, the directions to subscribe to my daily impact email, which I put out five mornings a week, uh, which hopefully will, they'll find valuable. And yes. if they'd like to look into joining the Go-Giver Success Alliance uh, online mentorship group, I welcome them to do that as well. Amazing. You guys, I would strongly recommend read the book, be a part of it. The daily is so helpful and it just fuels your soul. And even if you don't read it every day, you always will get the one I found. I just grabbed the one that, and for some reason, it's always what I need to hear that day. And I just believe that this world needs more positivity. I believe that there's so much goodness to be had. And I, like you said, I believe when we switch our focuses, we find everything that we're looking for. And so thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with the podcast. I'm just truly, truly honored. So thank you. Thank you for being so delightful. I appreciate you very much. Of course. And for all of you listening, I truly, truly just encourage you take action, read The Go-Giver. Remember, like change that focus to authentically loving other people. And as always, thanks for listening. I'll catch you next time on the Dental Team Podcast. And that wraps it up for another episode of the Dental Team Podcast. Thank you so much for listening and we'll talk to you next time.